So today we're looking at some more Advanced Dungeons and Dragons and in the Player's Handbook today we're picking out something that's worth a little bit of a topic of a discussion and it often gets ignored, dismissed as well as um, house ruled in so many different ways. Part of it is that it's not really covered to the depth that it should be because like all things it's up to the DM to work out how they would like to run this particular topic. So without uh, much further ado we're going to be looking at encumbrance and the weight allowance. So the first mention of anything to do with weight allowance or encumbrance comes under the strength chart which is the first chart that we get hit with and it just says simply plus 200 plus 300 minus 150 and so on so it doesn't really explain here what it's for or used for but this is where we find out that the gold pieces is how we measure everything and it's a ratio of pounds to gold pieces is 10 to 1. So 10 GP is equivalent to a 1 pound weight of measure, if you imagine that. So what it also says is that if you can imagine, if a character could normally carry 500 gold pieces without encumbrance, but the character had strength 17, instead of the normal 8 to 11 range, 1000 GP can be carried without incurring a movement penalty. From this we can take on that very first guess that the higher strength you have then the more you're able to carry and you're able to bring with you or walk out of a dungeon with. We also get from this that 500 gold pieces is the base from which we start on. And without any further reading anywhere else, you'd almost mostly be correct. What it doesn't talk about is in terms of encumbrance is obviously the movement allowance or uh, well the weight allowance when changes to movement and so on. There's a slight difference between weight allowance and encumbrance and this is where very niggling detail gets shifted between the two and it's whilst not explained directly or in an overt manner, in the very Gygaxian way, it just sort of leaves it hanging out there, if you know what I mean. And that's where we're positioned and constantly debating whether one chart means this or the words mean that. And ultimately it always comes down to how a DM rules. And this is one of those areas and another one of those points of what the DM needs to have figured out as to how they're doing before they move forward. There's not going to be a uniform method. You might connect with some other people and find out what they do, which is fine, and you may house rule it in certain ways. But we will try to look through all of this as it's written so that at the very least everyone has some information on how to make the best decision. Staying with the player's handbook for a few moments, we see that the weapons have an approximate weight in gold pieces and that's obviously useful because we need to track how much we can carry and what we can do. If you've got a 500 GP weight allowance and you've decided that you're going to be carrying a, an, a halberd with you then that's 175 GP in weight leaving you with whatever's left over before you begin to incur movement penalties to your particular weight and what you can carry, your weight allowance. So from here we get an idea that the weapons have a weight but we don't get anything else. For that we need to go to another book and this one is in the hands of the Dungeon Master. So whilst the players may walk around with a backpack, a box, an iron box, uh, a dozen lanterns and various torches, the next question that the DM is going to ask is, well how are you carrying it all? shove it all in my backpack. Everything's got uh, volume, the pouches, the sacks, the backpack, uh, even uh, to the point where it's a tied shirt is the same as a small sack. So obviously 
the players of Gary Gygax got that desperate that they were tying their shirts to make some makeshift sacks. And from there, we also have the horses as well, packs, pack animals and what they can carry and who's on what and who's carrying and so on. The, most of the items of the everyday lists are not covered in the player's handbook. And there's a little bit of a reason, I guess. Not much of a reason, but a little bit of a reason. And what we'll do is we're gonna flip over to the DM's guide and have a look at some weights over on that side. So we're over here at Appendix O, Encumbrance of Standard Items, which is all in GP weight. So this is where the weight allowance of all the products come through. Okay. And it makes a mention that whilst it's not a complete list, you can use this as a guide as to what you want the others to be. So a flask of oil versus a holy vial flask versus the, the potion, they're all roughly the same and would use roughly the same weight of and volume. So as the, um, the text in here says, most people looking at the table will say, but a scroll doesn't weigh two pounds. The encumbrance figure should not be taken as the weight of the object, it is combined weight and relative bulkiness of the item. These factors determine how much a figure can carry. And that's the important part, is that we're looking at how bulky something is. So a quiver is relatively bulky, but is it as bulky as jewellery? No, and that sort of thing. So what we need to do is we, need to, we can carry jewellery in a pouch, but we'll need a backpack for other items to be able to carry. On this same page, there's a very interesting point. The maximum weight a normal strength person can carry and still move is 150 pounds or 1500 GP. So that's always interesting. We'll get into that in a few moments. Now certain items are not included for figuring encumbrance, and this is the important thing, they're not included. Most material components are not included as encumbrance. So various items that a magic user might need for his or her spells aren't necessary to be counted as a bulky item. Obviously if it says that it needs to have be a, a 100 GP gem of X size, that's going to have bulk. But for the most part, when you've got your crickets and your rose petals and bags of sand, you're not needing to cover that for encumbrance. Other things is you get one set of clothing that's on you at all times before your armor and everything else, and that's not included in encumbrance either. Extra sets of clothes that you may carry, they are covered. Anything but a great helm, so if you've got your uh, carrying, all armor includes a helmet, and so you don't need to add anything extra, but if you get a great helm, then the great helm does add an additional weight. And of course the thieves picks and tools are not required either as part of encumbrance because they're just wires and clips and various other trinkets that are kept around the person of the thief they're not something that needs to be carried in bags and pouches you just have them and so on also most of the time the holy symbols are not counted for encumbrance either which is always quite good when you've got your special holy symbols made for the clerics and they they might feel bulky, but obviously we don't want to discourage clerics from carrying holy symbols. So they're not included. And here we come to the armor table. So with the armor table, you've got the weight of the armor in pounds, so you have to multiply it by 10. And it took me a very long time as a child to realize that the hash meant pounds, which is obviously an American thing, but that's fine we can work in two languages. As well as what's now important, bulk and base movement. So this is when we start to figure out exactly what are the impacts of carrying too much. You can have a lot on your person and you can carry 500 GPs worth of weight or 50 pounds. You're a Roman soldier, a Roman soldier carries 45 pounds worth of gear as a standard. And that's the minimum requirement. And that's what everyone was tested at. 
And that includes the armor as well as everything else. The full kit of a Rome soldier was just under 50 pounds. The bulk is something that we use as a DM's tool for determining how nimble someone can be. So a fairly bulky versus a bulky and non-bulky. If you've got a non-bulky item or you're wearing non-bulky armor, you might have a little bit more maneuverability and movement of running across the rooftops or moving around trees and just general ease of movement or swimming as an example. Fairly bulky versus then bulky and then you'll have limitations as to what can be done. Is it written anywhere? No. But there were modules where they allowed a modifier for actions based on the bulk of the armor. And so that's always interesting. When you read some of those older modules that were based on tournaments and uh, from the original days, it's quite interesting to see how there were additional ideas for rules. Because obviously anything in the books are rules, but these other points are ideas for rules or ideas for adjustments or you making use of what's in the rule books to be able to actually build the games further. So the base movement, we're assuming that everyone has a 12 inch move as a start and there's a few people that would argue that halflings and so on don't have 12 inch moves, they should be less, but you know, it's probably just easier to keep it as the same movement for everybody but obviously DMs do what DMs want to do. But the base movement for a normal, unencumbered and non-armoured, unbulky, etc, 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 a person is 12 inches. Then if you put on chainmail, you now move to fairly bulky and you have a 9 inch movement. So that, whilst you're unencumbered, you can move your 9 inches of movement without a problem. The moment you become encumbered, then your movement changes. And now we're going to flick back to the player's handbook to have a look at this particular chart. Okay, so down here on page 101, we have something that's a little bit more explanatory, but also kind of odd. We're now talking about encumbrance with a little bit more detail without actually mentioning detail. It just says that the amount of 20 pounds of feathers in a sack are cumbersome even though they're feathers and it's 20 pounds it could be worth more as carrying because it comes out to cumbersome. The interesting bit here is your encumbrance, your movement adjustment and reaction and initiative. So this is the first time where we start to realize that is there a modifier for initiative if we are unencumbered. There are plenty of rules for your drowning if you're encumbered. Uh, if you're unencumbered and you're in water, odds are you may not drown. But if you are encumbered of pretty much any sort and you're in water, you're going to drown. And that's about all it says about that in the, the DM's guide. So over here we have a few extra points. A lot of these could be seen as thought bubbles all put together and then not really collated as well as could be, but we still have to read what is here. So normal gear about 35 pounds and no great bulk of bulk. Movement is 12 inches, subject can run quickly, normal or better on your reaction and initiative. Heavy gear, armor and or equipment of about 70 pounds or fairly bulky, nine inch subject, nine inch movement, and the subject can make a lumbering run. So now we've got the next one round here, which is six inch movement, slowed, heavy gear, armor, equipment, and 105 pounds bulky, such as plate armor. Then you've got the next one taking it even further. So strength penalties or bonuses will modify these guidelines. And that's pretty much what it says here. So herein we've got something that talks about 350 GP weight and what was said earlier about the 500 GP weight. As weird as it sounds, what that previous sample was saying and in the text before it 
was, here's an example of how encumbrance should be measured and how it works. If we have a look at someone with six to seven strength, they have minus 150, which goes to 350. Not that that particular example was saying, let's take for example a character of strength six to seven. This is pretty much where I think that it moves to in that regard because the 500 category is kept in the DM's guide where it says 1500 is the most you can move and if we have a look at the other chart it goes up in terms of the 500 to 1000 to 1500 and then you really can't move much at all after that which is exactly the same as what we're talking about uh, with here if we look at the the explanation of weight allowance and it says 500 GP without encumbrance and then we add the the character's strength so Gary Gygax when he wrote many of these things wrote once and quite often left points as well isn't it obvious without actually an explanation in the modern era of game design and in writing Obviously we go straight to charts and tables. We know that now and that's how we work. The same deal with the surprise tables Because they don't match up with the text we go straight to the the tables and charts and then we get confused by What was written because we don't sort of equate the two Same two here in encumbrance. He sort of mentions it. He says yep look it's 500 GPs without encumbered and oh, And we're off but then there's a single example where he makes a statement of let's I'm about to show you an example where weight and encumbrance is really important and you can see what happens. I think if you've got a six to seven strength, you're not going to be running in plate mail armor anyway because you're not going to be able to be a fighter. So there's always that. But anyway, the charts are always going to be a little bit off because if we don't have proper explanations. But we can talk about how the modern era would not write these books in the same way. And that is, of course, what we love about these books is how they've been written. They've got the Gygaxian prose and they are filled with, even in some instances, contradictions. And we'll have a look at one of those in a few moments as we go back to the DM's guide. So we're back to the armor and encumbrance tables. So the last risk that's on top of the weight says assuming human size. So we are actually now assuming human size, meaning that it's going to be slightly different for elves and half orcs or gnomes, dwarves, halflings, half elves, so on. But we don't know by what values. We can assume if you're a medium sized creature, everything's gonna be roughly the same. That would be medium. And if you're small, would it be adjusted? We don't know, but imagine yes. So here we are with the encumbrance for the armor as it's listed here. First, let's look here, where it says that as the DM, you are meant to understand how the armor class system works. Because it's all worked out, you need to understand it and you have to follow the progressions and so on and so forth. So you have to get, figure it out. You gotta know it. And that's a great, that's a great statement to, from the designer. As a DM, you must be fully conversant with the armor gradation system and so on. So we get that. You go armor class two and you have a plus one Magical adjustment, it goes to armor class one. And you have dexterity and it takes it even further. Now, the next paragraph, for game purposes, all magical armor should be considered weightless and equal to normal clothing, let us assume. And so on. And then it says that you have the base movement equal to an unarmored, that the un unencumbered levels. Magic shields weigh the same as a normal shield. Alrighty, so this is where we have that in the armor and shields with the magic section way down in the back of the DM's guide. 
as we flip over here. When magic armor is worn, assume that the properties allow movement of the next higher base rate and that the weight is cut by 50%. There is no magical elfin chain and shields are the same weight as they were in their non-magic counterparts. So, weightless, not weightless. It counts as normal clothing, is, improves it up to the next higher base rate and is cut by 50%. Again, as the DM, you're gonna to have to figure out how you want to do that. The weight half by half was of, there could even be that um, he was sick and tired of everyone having magical plate mail and running around as if they got normal clothing and you can imagine, you can see what he was thinking by the time he wrote this part and he put it in. He was like, no, magic armor is worn. It's just a next level up and it's a half weight. Boom, done, job done. Over at the character sheet end, we have this. Now, of course, I'm using a character record sheet that I love using and spruiking, and they're all awesome. These are based off the originals back in the day. And we have our charts here. Left side, center or back, and right side. Again, there's no modifiers for having more on one side or the other, but I always made sure as my personal house rule was just that within a certain tolerance, generally 10% from the left side to the right side. And then of course we have our carrying capacities and our provisions that we need to make sure that we have. So you have a couple of large sacks, you put a large sack there in the container, the maximum volume and what it's currently loaded at. There's also the movement rate, load versus movement rate, which is really cool because it helps keep that in mind and the strength adjustment. So if you have a plus 300 GP strength adjustment, your normal equals one is 800, then 16, then 21, and so on. So whilst you get to that last category of, well, how heavy can I, I move, how far can I move before I can no longer move any further, it's really just about those, that, that last category, you're not, you're just making footsteps. You're not really doing a lot. If you're moving at, um, even in a, at, uh, with no armor and you've gone from 12 inches to three inches movement, that's 30 feet in a minute. You are just loaded up. That is so bulky, which is in effect not movement at all. It's just shuffling. But at the loaded, it's a little bit less than that. So anyway, so what we have is the how much movement gets adjusted by your bulk. And here's one we filled out earlier. So we have our backpack with our volume, we have our large sacks, small sacks, pouches, and we have our magical items. We also have all of our items that are being carried by the character. You notice the character has a pony, so that some of these items are also moved over to the pony section. And yes, the horse's name is actually Bollocks. So he likes to make reference of exercising his bollocks. It's all handy, where then you've got it all written in here. And so on. So over here we have our weight. He's got magical armor, magical chainmail. So the chainmail moves from nine to 12. So that's how it fills out. So with encumbrance, you just need to keep it in. As, you don't have to go and measure every single gold piece weight. Of course, we have it all together, and so we have how, many, how much gold we're carrying, and we put it all in our pouches, and we put it in the backpacks, and we have a general idea. Whilst, yes, there is also two GP for every arrow. How many arrows are we firing? Oops, I've just fired my third arrow. So now I've gone from being at three quarters movement to full movement. You have room to play 
as the DM, use it as a guideline, use it as an idea, and think about the difference between bulk, where you've got your levels of, of bulkiness, as well as how encumbered you are by your weight allowance, and marrying the two up. If you're one GP over, and so on. So the, the, the DM has some room to move and to, to allow some sort of levels of play in that. And that's not breaking the rules or destroying the game and you're not going against everything, but it just helps keep a little bit of the peace because you want the characters to still be able to carry the equipment that they want and be able to do what they need to do. Whilst at the same time, you don't want them to be running around with 10,000 gold pieces in a sack and so on. And you just got to uh, keep all that under control. So hopefully I've not confused the issue any further. I've tried to highlight where some of the, the text doesn't marry up, where we've left it a little bit open-ended for the DM to interpret and Yes, as much as we'd like to play rules as written, we sometimes play rules as best as we can. And those rules written can sometimes be amended even within the same text. The hierarchy is often taken as a rule written in the Monster Manual is then overruled by something from the Player's Handbook, which is then ultimately overruled by something from the DM's Guide. That's the, the dates of how they've been published. And that's a fair and reasonable expectation as well. We also need to understand, as we said before, as I said before, that uh, Gary liked to say things once. He had some serious real estate to work in with some of these books, and so he needed to make sure that the message got out and then he didn't have to repeat himself. One classic example on this, and I'll just flick it over quickly, so one classic example of him saying something once and then moving on is this point here when it comes to the 10% of how the 10% but modify for experience. He only says it here. Then after this, you're expected to know that this is how it works, which is fine. And then in the next entry of the Druid and the Fighters, you've got this, you have these scores, you gain 10% and that's it. Whereas this is the only part where it's actually written how it works. And that's what I mean. He's always putting in little notes, he says it once, and expects everyone to just assume that it's something that's straightforward and obvious, he doesn't even mention. The final point in order on that is what he writes about the fighter, which has almost nothing about the fighter because he just immediately assumes that everybody knows exactly what a fighter is capable of doing and being that how wide ranged the actual character class is and what the character class can do so he doesn't talk about it because he's got only so many words to use and so much space to fill he'd rather fill it up with something more important like i don't know psionics anyway so this is what we have to try and contend with when we're understanding a lot of this from the modern era. And I understand that uh, as he grew older and as he was able to explain and expand and rethink and revisit, he was able to readjust and much like the reimagined original trilogy of Star Wars when George Lucas remade them, there were a few points where I was like, yeah, I wouldn't have done that if I did that again and had the option of doing it again. So, But that's where what we've got here is the other books as we're written and we like to try and play them as best we can. So I want to thank everybody for their support and I want to thank everybody for putting comments in and for giving me ideas. That was a question of, you know, this is, how do we do this? How does this happen? And so it's like, okay, let's have a look at this. I am a big believer in encumbrance just because I think it goes with the game balance. And I'm also a big believer in using the 
bulkiness of armor as a way of modifying what characters can and can't do or what adjustments are done. Somebody wants to climb a tree, that's gonna come into play, not just encumbrance and weight allowance, but also how bulky their armor is. And it might just affect their speed or it might stop them from doing something completely. And if you wanna see how people in plate mouse swim, then I suggest you watch the movie Excalibur because the director of the day put them in real armor and pushed them in the water. And so therefore the drowning effects that their characters had were more realistic in his mind. It's always a good go-to anyway to watch Excalibur just to see how armor and weapons work because they tried to keep it to a, a real standard. Anyway, alas, I digress. So thank you very much. I appreciate everyone's help and keeping this going and I will take on board any criticisms, of course, and I will also like to hear how people did their own encumbrance. I'm sure that once we'd gotten used to a few different styles of gameplay, we were able to readjust and how it all worked. But in the original days when we just had the books and the text, we just had to try and make do with what we did. So I'd be interested to know what other people did for their characters. Thanks again last time, honestly, and I appreciate everything. Signing off. Like, subscribe, all the, all the usual rigmaroles. Uh, the character record sheets are on the Patreon site, so you, they're just on the free, you just go in and, and pull them down off there. Uh, they were on another website elsewhere, but um, that one seems to have disappeared, so luckily I had some, uh, I, I have the ability to, to show them up. Um, download them, have a look, play. The original character sheets are the best for doing, trying to keep it as written, in my mind, sorry, in my opinion, as we would say. And I appreciate all you guys. All right, thanks. Bye.